It's been stated that a faith not worth confessing is a faith not worth having. Now, I don't know who originally stated that. I've heard it through the years by various people. And it is a true statement. I mean, not dealing specifically with a biblical principle, but just a general principle. If you believe something, well, it ought to be worth confessing. If it's not worth confessing, really, it's not worth having too much. And that's, as I say, it's a general teaching or general principle that certainly has a Bible application as well. But in our lesson this morning, I want us to consider the aspect of confessing. And first, when we look at that, we need to ask the question, what is confession? The online etymology dictionary, now an etymology is basically a history of the word. It's not what a dictionary does necessarily because a dictionary tells you the application of the word at, the, at that time. Etymology goes back into the history to tell you here's how it came to mean that today. So understand what an etymology is, and if you love words, which we all should really, uh, studying etymology of words is really interesting. But in the online etymology dictionary, it states concerning the word confession that it is a late 14th century transitive and intransitive make a vowel or admission of, and then in parentheses, a fault, crime, sin, debt, etc. From the old French, confessor, which is transitive and intransitive, and from the vulgar Latin, confessere. Uh, by the way, vulgar simply means common. So if you see that word vulgar, the actual meaning of it is dealing with common, uh, which presents sometimes a good lesson as to vulgarity today. Might be a good study for you. But the vulgar Latin confessere, a frequentive form from Latin confess, Past particle stem, stem of confetary to acknowledge from assimilated form of com together, see con, with fetary to admit, akin to fairy, speak from the pi root, ma, to speak, to tell, or to say. And when you look at that, it's basically stating, if you look at the pretty much the first part of it, to make a vow or admission of, whether you're dealing with a fault, a crime, a sin, debt, whatever it might be. When we go back to the biblical word, though, it comes from a Greek word, homologio. And that Greek word is made up of two parts. The first part of it is homu, which means same or one and the same. And then you have the Greek word lego, which means to speak. Thus, the word confess, as translated from the Greek word, means to speak one and the same. In its application from a biblical standpoint, it is to speak one and the same thing that God said. So you have God saying something and 
to confess thus is to speak one and the same thing that God said. And so that brings us to the question, what did the Father say? What did God say? <clears throat> and I want to approach it from two standpoints because both aspects need to be discussed in dealing with the subject of confession. What did God say regarding sin, first off? Well, Paul sums it up very succinctly in Romans 3 and verse 23 when he says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what God has said concerning sin. That all men have sinned. In Galatians, the third chapter, in verse 22, Paul again sums it up when he says, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Christ Jesus might be given to them that believe. Now then, when you look at the scripture hath concluded, since the scriptures come from the very breath of God himself, we could say that God hath concluded because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. St. Timothy 3 and verse 16. If all scriptures have been given by inspiration of God and the scriptures conclude that all are under sin, then it stands to reason that God has concluded all under sin. Now that's what God has stated in relationship to sin. We'll come back and look at these more, but right now we're trying to limit ourselves to what did God say? There's a second aspect, and that is what did God say regarding Jesus? When Jesus went to John the Baptist to be baptized of him, we know that initially John did not want to. He wanted to turn around and says, I need to be baptized of you. But Jesus tells him to allow it to be so at this time to fulfill all righteousness. He did not commit sin and so it was not for sin even though John's baptism was for the remission of sins. But since Jesus did not commit sin, had no sin, his was to fulfill all righteousness. That is, God had commanded baptism through John the Baptist. And Jesus was obeying that command of God. He was doing what God says and thus fulfilling all righteousness. But in Matthew's account, Matthew 3 and verse 16 and 17, when he was baptized, he went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of, the, of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And thus God's statement, the Father's statement concerning Jesus of Nazareth is, This is my Son. I'm well pleased with my Son. He is my beloved Son, he says. Later on in the ministry of Jesus, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. He takes them up to a high mountain. He's transfigured before them. Matthew, the 17th chapter. There appears before him Moses and Elijah speaking with him. And Peter, awakening out of sleep, makes the decision to say, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us build here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And Matthew 17 and verse 5, it says, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now, not to deal so much with the implications of hear ye him, as opposed to hearing Moses and Elijah, but yet the voice out of God in relationship to Jesus of Nazareth again states, this is my son. And again, I'm well pleased with him. Now, we could 
Again, go to and look at the implications of I am well pleased. Why? Because he was always doing the will of the Father. He was always obedient. He had never committed sin. But here's the Father saying concerning Jesus, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, and now hear ye him. That's what God, the Father, has said concerning Jesus of Nazareth and concerning man. Man, on the other hand, we have the obligation of confessing. That is, we say one and the same thing as God. In the process first of being saved, we must confess. That's what Romans uh, 10 and verses 9 and verse 10 states, that if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Can't help but uh, just pause here in relationship to this verse that many individuals want to look at this verse and say that completes the salvation process at, right, at that point. They would have it read that with the heart man believeth and is say, or is righteous and with the mouth confession is made and he is saved. Not that it is unto salvation, but it is once one does that, he is saved. That's not what it says, though. This is a preposition unto that is looking forward to something. It is still yet in the future. The belief, the confession is not what gives us salvation. It's necessary for us to receive it, but the salvation is still yet in the future. That's why he uses the preposition unto, and that's properly translated. But we see in this verse that one of those necessary things in that salvation process is the act of confession. And so, in that process of being saved, we must confess. Now then, again, confession is saying the same thing that God said concerning Jesus. What was it that God said concerning Jesus? This is my son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, as Jesus takes his apostles to Caesarea Philippi, a city that, or I say that was literally built upon a rock, he asked them who men say that he is, and upon hearing their response as to the populace, the people's views concerning him, he asked his apostles, who do you say that I am? And in verse 16, it says that Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now notice the statement here in relationship to what God had said both at the baptism of Jesus and at the transfiguration of Jesus. This is my Son, my beloved Son. What was that that Simon Peter was confessing here? Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. He is saying one and the same thing as what God the Father had said. Notice Jesus' response, though, to what Simon has said. He said, Jesus said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Notice, my father revealed your statement to you. What was his statement? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What was it? God had stated, this is my beloved Son. Peter is making that same, one and the same 
statement that the Father said. And Jesus says, my Father which is in heaven has revealed this to you. We might ask the question though, how did the Father reveal this to Peter? Well first, that which we've already seen at the baptism of Jesus. He had revealed this to Peter at that time. But also, John the Baptist revealed it. When in John 1 and verse 29 it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He is setting forth now that here is the Son of God. Here is that one who is going to be that Lamb of God that takes away sin. John's duty was pointing people to Jesus, that Son of God. That child that was prophesied that was going to be born. So John the Baptist, in hearing John the Baptist, John was revealing this to Peter and others, but we're specifically dealing with Peter right now because Peter is the one who made that confession stating one and the same thing as God the Father had said. Another one that revealed this unto him was his own brother, Andrew. Andrew heard John and went and told Peter John 1, verse 35 and 36, again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked said, Behold the Lamb of God. Now then, one of those two disciples we find in verse 40 through verse 42 is Andrew. It says one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So Andrew has heard this statement by John. Now then, what's he going to do? He first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which by interpretation a stone. What is it? Andrew heard John and Andrew then told Peter about Jesus. And thus, God was revealing this to, G to Peter. One way was through Andrew, his brother. Another way was by the miracles that he performed. Jesus performed many miracles. We might recall what uh, Nicodemus said that of Jesus that no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And so by the miracles that Jesus was performing, he was proving, he was demonstrating that he was the Son of God. And so he had several avenues of testimony that had been given to him as to Jesus being the Son of God. Now notice that as I went through these things, I did not mention the transfiguration. You might be wondering, well, why didn't you mention the transfiguration? He was there on that occasion. He heard the Father say that. Transfiguration took place after Peter had made this statement. And so it was not a part of that process that Peter heard and brought to him a knowledge that Jesus was the Son of God. It gave added confirmation to that which he knew, but he made the confession prior to the transfiguration. And so it just gave added confirmation. It did not provide him that information. And so we see that in that salvation process, here's Peter's statement. And Peter made that confession, made that one and the same statement that God the Father had made. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
In 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, in verse 13, as Paul is writing to his son in the faith, he tells him, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Paul now makes the statement that here is Jesus Christ, he, when he was before Pontius Pilate, witnessed a good confession. Well, since we're talking about confession, that should pique our interest. What was it that the Father had said? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Well, if we see now Paul saying that Christ witnessed a good confession before Pontius Pilate, we need to go back and we look, need to look and consider what Jesus said in relationship to Pontius Pilate. Well, those times is in Matthew 27, verse 11. And when Jesus stood before the governor, the governor here has reference to Pontius Pilate. The governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. Jesus makes an affirmation in relationship to Pontius Pilate's question, Are you the king of the Jews? He's basically saying, Yes, I am. That's the way in which uh, we would express it. Thou sayest. Or uh, we might uh, put it, What you said is true. It's accurate. He is accepting that appellation of being the king of the Jews. In John the 18th chapter, we have a little bit more detail in relationship to this. When they are discussing and Jesus says to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate then therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Jesus again affirmed what Pilate had said. Are you a king? Well, yes, I am a king. And let me just mention that Jesus, in these statements, simply affirmed the truthfulness of Pilate's question. Every once in a while, we run across the controversy, if I can use that term, of whether or not someone can just say yes if in the process of becoming a Christian they make that confession and the preacher or whoever is doing this asks them, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? And they say yes, and they say, oh no, he can't do that. He's got to say it himself. Well, Paul here writing by the inspiration of God, says that Jesus witnessed a good confession before Pontius Pilate, and all Jesus said was basically, yes, that's correct. Thus, if it was good enough for Jesus simply to affirm it, why isn't it good enough for us? And if we're affirming it and saying yes, you know, I guess most of you know that there were some things that were stolen from us not within the past few weeks. Police come out, take a report, and at the end of that report, she said, raise your right hand and uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the things that you have stated to me in this report is true? Yeah, I did that, and guess what I said? Yes. That was a legally binding statement. That if I lied in that report, then I can be prosecuted. Now, and if I should appear before the judge because I lied in that report, could I say, well, judge, I didn't say it. All I said was yes. Uh, he might, uh, after he stopped laughing a while, 
uh, say you need to go and be examined by some medical professionals to see if you're crazy or not. Why? Because everyone recognizes the affirmation is the same thing as the statement. That's what Jesus did. He made an affirmation. He didn't make the total statement, but yet Peter or Paul would say by inspiration he witnessed a good confession. One other example of in that process of being saved, the confession that is made would be in Acts 8 chapter and verse 37. When Philip is preached to the eunuch, the Ethiopian of Jesus, they come to a water. The Ethiopian asks the question, can I be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now that's the statement that God the Father had made concerning Jesus. It's the confession that Peter made in relationship to Jesus. It is that confession that Jesus made in front of Pontius Pilate. And now then, here's this Ethiopian making the same confession, and based upon that, he baptized him. And so in the process of becoming a Christian, we see the need to make a confession. It is a confession of faith. Our belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But then there's confession in relationship to sin, and that is as a wayward child of God that that individual must make. And we see the basis of that in 1 John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now first, that demands a realization of sin. What is sin? Well, John describes it in 1 John 3 and verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of law. We generally classify sin under two categories. That is sins of commission. That is, I commit something that transgresses the law. And thus it is a sin of commission in that I have transgressed the law and thus committed sin. Then there are sins of omission. That is, I have omitted doing something that the law demands. And since I have omitted doing something that the law demands me to do, I have committed sin because I transgressed the law. There must be a recognition thus of I have transgressed God's law. I have committed sin. And thus it is saying I have sinned. Now what did God say? The conclusion of the scriptures is all of sin. Or Romans 3 and verse 23, all of sin come short of the glory of God. Confessing is I am saying one and the same thing as God. God said that I have sinned. I am saying I have sinned. But there's a lot of things in relationship to a wayward child of God and making a confession of sin, in this case, that's not true confession of sin. Every once in a while we come across someone who says and wants to confess sins by saying, if I have offended someone, I'm sorry. What if makes it kind of conditional? Maybe I didn't. Maybe I did. I don't really know. It's not saying I have sinned. I have offended someone. Or some will just say, if I've sinned. Well, have you sinned? Which is it? God says you have sinned. Have you sinned? Well, if I have, no. Have you? It's not if, not conditional. It's a statement of I have sinned. 
Or every once in a while we come across someone who wants to tell the wrong of other people and what other people have done, and specifically what other people have done to them. Instead of, I have committed sin, it's they're the ones who are at fault, they're the ones who did this. And then we would also add that in confession of sin, there is no need to announce sin. It's a simply a confession of sin. I don't have to announce sin. I have sinned, yes. But that doesn't mean that I necessarily have to go into all of the juicy details to satisfy the whims and the evil desires of, it, of everyone. In fact, sometimes it causes way more trouble than what it's good for. Congregations and elderships, preachers learned very quickly, you do not allow a person to get up and just say whatever they want to say. Why? Because there's some things that they might say that's going to cause more problems. It is a statement of, I have sinned. It's not a necessarily announcing sins to, to other individuals. But also saying, I have sinned, is not enough without the proper action. You know, Jesus said, and not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Saying is not enough, doing must come with it. In confession, simply saying, I have sinned, without any action following is not sufficient. There must be repentance. In the last couple of weeks, we talked about the subject of repentance. Repentance and all that that means must take place in regards to that confession. Look at Simon the sorcerer. Here he was. Uh, the gospel has been preached there at Samaria. Simon the sorcerer obeyed that gospel. And in that process of obeying the gospel, even though it doesn't state it, he made a confession of his faith in Jesus Christ. That's implication, by the way. I know that in the process of Simon the sorcerer becoming a Christian, he made a confession. Why? Because confess, confession is necessary to salvation. Does it ever state it? No. That's implication. But now then, when Peter and John are sent to Samaria to impart miraculous powers to others, laying hands upon others. Simon the sorcerer sees Peter and John are able to impart this miraculous power to other individuals. I want that power. I want that ability. And so he offered them money for it. And Peter states in verses 22 through verse 24 of Acts 8, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee, for thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye the Lord for me, that none of those things which ye have spoken come upon me. He recognized the need to repent in relationship to that confession of his sins. He recognized his sin, and he asked, upon being told to repent, pray for me, that I don't lose my soul. David was one after God's own heart, but yet David sinned. We have in the 51st Psalm a psalm of repentance on his part. I want to direct your attention to verses 13 through verse 17 in particular because he says, Then will I teach transgressors thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou de desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. 
The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, wilt thou not despise. You see, David's cry for forgiveness. Why? Because he had committed sin. But now then, notice the results. What goes along with that repentance? Go back to verse 13. He says, basically, I will teach others. There's an aspect of forgiveness. I will then teach others. In verse 14, he says, I will sing of God's forgiveness. And again in verse 15, he says, I will show forth my pray, thy praise. So he's going to praise God. And those two ideas, sing aloud of thy righteousness. Uh, my mouth shall show forth thy praise. The singing of God's forgiveness, praising God. Those, certainly, those ideas certainly go together. And then in verses 16 and 17, you have that idea of a repentant heart is what pleases God. David confessed his sin. And now then, after that confession and forgiveness, he's going to teach others. He's going to sing of God's forgiveness and praise God. And he has a repentant, a broken and contrite heart because he knows that's what pleases God. In becoming a Christian, we must confess Christ. Based upon our faith, our repentance from our sins, we make a confession just like Peter did, just like Jesus did before Pontius Pilate, just like the Ethiopian did. Before, uh, uh, before Philip, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God. Why? Because that's saying the same thing as what God said. When as a Christian, though, we commit sin, we are to confess our sins. Why? Because God says all of sin and come short of the glory of God. The conclusion of the scriptures is that we commit sin. And so we confess our sins with the attendant repentance and prayer to God for forgiveness. And then act then properly based upon that forgiveness that God has extended to us. If you've not become a Christian this morning, we would encourage you to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian but you've got fallen back into sin and wickedness, we would encourage you to uh, repent of your sins. Make a confession of your sin this, this morning. Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins. And God's promised his forgiveness, even as David knew that he would be forgiven. And then you can live that attendant righteous life, praising God for the forgiveness that you have. Teach others about his forgiveness. If you need to come to respond to that invitation that our Lord extends, we would encourage you to do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.